world. You'll discover how Old Testament sacrifices were gifts from the heart, only tangentially related to killing and death. You'll see in Christ's cross the ultimate gift that ushers us into communion with God. And you'll find inspiration to offer your own gifts alongside Christ's, inviting God into your life. Welcoming gifts, sacrifice in the Bible and Christian life. Now available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook at store.ancientfaith.com. Hi, this is Father Evan Armitas, priest at St. Spirit on Greek Orthodox Church in Loveland, Colorado, and the host of the Ancient Faith Radio Sunday night call-in show, Orthodoxy Live. I am pleased to announce today the release of my first book for Ancient Faith Publishing, titled Toolkit for Spiritual Growth, A Practical Guide to Prayer, Fasting, and Almsgiving. It seeks to provide a guide to the three basic and primary disciplines of Orthodox spirituality. Through these disciplines, Christ opened for us a path that frees us from the disordered way of life that has become normal for many, even though their hearts and minds tell them otherwise. Please join me in exploring the three-legged stool of Orthodox spiritual practice, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Books now available at store.ancientfaith.com. And the title, once again, is Toolkit for Spiritual Growth. I look forward to sharing it with you. God bless. is Ancient Faith Today with Father Tom Soroka, a weekly live call-in show addressing the issues of our day from a distinctly orthodox perspective. You can join the conversation by calling in at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Father Tom is the priest at St. Nicholas Orthodox Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and welcomes guests from across the globe to discuss important topics of interest. Here's Father Tom. Welcome to Ancient Faith Today. This is Father Tom Soroka, and I'm so glad that you're with us this evening. We'll be taking your calls in a bit at 1-855-AF-RADIO. That's 1-855-237-2346. John Maddox will be answering your calls tonight, so please make sure to turn the show volume off before you come on air. To participate online, we encourage you to go to the AFM Facebook page at facebook.com slash Ancient Faith Ministries and place a question or a comment in the thread for tonight's show where it is now being live simulcast. You can also send us an email at aft at ancientfaith.com. And if you'd like to send us a question or a comment to us instantly, you can send us a text to 412-206-5012. Again, our SMS text number is 412-206-5012. So let's get started. We do live our lives throughout the week often as individual Christians. We have our jobs, we have our family lives. And we know that we are members of the body of Christ, but ne many of us have never thought about how everything actually happens in the church when we show up. We arrive at the temple, we buy a candle, we give our offering, we participate in the service, we receive the Eucharist, we talk to our friends, and we go home. Maybe flowers appear at a particular season, but we're not really sure how they got there. We know that the children go off to church school, but we're not exactly sure who teaches them or what they learn. The choir sings a beautiful new hymn, and we appreciate it, but we don't know exactly how they learned it. We read the bulletin, and it's nice to have it every week, but we have no idea who compiles or prints it. We heard about some food pantry that the church is sponsoring, but beyond giving a check to support it, we've never really seen how that food is distributed. 
and there are dozens of other things that many of our parishes do, and these things somehow to some people just automatically happen, often sadly without the involvement of many of the parishioners. Worse yet, there may be some parishes who are quite insular and struggling. And they don't understand why their children aren't around anymore, and the parishioners mostly just talk endlessly after the Divine Liturgy about how, quote, things used to be. And other than having a Divine Liturgy on Sunday morning with a handful of parishioners in the aging building of the area where no one lives anymore, that building doesn't really get much other use. There's a palpable sense of hopelessness and sadness because the future of the parish looks very bleak. So tonight, we're going to talk about parish life. We're going to talk about increasing ministry. And sadly, as soon as some people hear that M word, that is ministry, they tune out. They say, well, that's the priest's job, or that's the parish council's job, or worse yet, we don't do ministry, we're orthodox. We only have church services. Can you imagine? Of course, neither response is Christian, or biblical, or traditional, and certainly not orthodox. So tonight, we're going to talk about parish ministries. And this really does concern everyone all of our listeners, just not priests and just not parish councils. Do you know what St. Paul says in the fourth chapter of Ephesians? That the reason that we have apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers is that therefore, quote, the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. That's right. The people are the ones that are called to do the work of ministry. And I know that's a foreign concept to some of our listeners, but that's the way it's supposed to work. The work of the pastors and the leaders is to teach and bless and equip the members, the parishioners, to do the work of ministry, of service, both to one another and to those outside the church. And so we're going to talk about ministry. And we welcome tonight two leaders in the area of expanding ministries. First, Father Alexander Cadman, who has much experience, especially in the area of college, of collegiate ministry. He's currently the pastor of St. Mary and Michael Orthodox Church in Ervona and Madera, Pennsylvania. And we're going to talk with Joseph Cormos. Joseph is well known in the area of expanding parish ministries. He's worked for over 40 years in this particular uh, area. He has uh, given hundreds and hundreds of talks and articles, and he currently works within the parish development ministry of the uh, Midwest Diocese and the Western Pennsylvania Diocese of the OCA. Father Alexander Cadman and Joe Cormos, welcome to Ancient Faith Today. Thank you, Father. This is Joe. Uh, great introduction, by the way. Uh, <laughs> pleasure Joe. to be here. Oh, we're glad and you're here, well. Father Alexander. Hi, yes, how pleasure are you? Well. Good. Good to hear my two good friends. And uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation tonight because it's really important. Um, and and I, I, I kind of wanted to stress that I, I, I know, you know, often like I'll be looking at the show, I'll look at how many people are viewing and so forth. And I know when people hear ministry, they're like, oh, that's not for me, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's, that's something that I, I'm not involved in. So um, I, before we kind of get to the nuts and bolts of what ministry is and so forth, I know that the two of you are planning a uh, a, a day-long uh, series of webinars on expanding parish ministries, and we're going to talk about that near the end of the show, so we want everybody to tune in to learn about how they can join into that uh, particular conference. But what I would like to talk to you about now is to kind of ask you, what is the status 
of parishes today, especially post pandemic. Uh, obviously we weren't prepared for the, the, the pandemic. We didn't know how it would uh, brutally sometimes affect our parish life. Um, what effects did it have? What good effects did it have? What bad effects did it have? So I'm, I'm gonna open that up to both of you. Joe, why don't you go first and, and kind of give us your thoughts about where you see things today? Thanks, Father Tom. I, I guess the obvious answer is that there is a spectrum, okay? There is a spectrum of the way parishes are behaving now that uh, we hope the pandemic is clearly behind us. On the one hand, I would say that there are many parishes that are tired. They're very tired. Mm. This was a, you, you don't need me to tell, tell us that uh, this was a rough, rough patch. It was a rough go mm. for all of us. We had to do things differently. And uh, there is a natural, I'd say, desire to want to be normal again. Uh, sure. But relative to that term normal, and we've all heard this new normal, and I will never say that word, that phrase again. Uh, I, I read something in a, in a newsletter that I get uh, from someone who, who refers to this idea of getting back to normal as going back to Egypt. You know, she said, uh, these past two years have been traumatic, been difficult, and then yet people say they want to get back to normal or go back to Egypt. And the question becomes, why go through so much just to go back to the way things were? Now, right. I my experience, though, is that uh, a lot of parishes are not going back to the way things were, maybe not explicitly, mm -hmm. maybe they don't have what would I say, a plan? Uh, but there are a lot of parishes, Orthodox parishes in varying uh, geographies that are experiencing new life and new faces. Some are bursting yeah. at the seams. And uh, that's a great thing. We can talk as to what the, what the characteristics are and what the drivers are. So I would say there's a, a wide variety. I don't know, Father Alexander, any uh, any uh, any different comments or uh, on that topic? I do agree that there's there's a spectrum, and it, it's hard to generalize. And it, coming from actually, I had an opportunity to serve several parishes past uh, the, the pandemic, and in fact, uh, it was interesting. Uh, my, my most recent full-time assignment was in State College, Pennsylvania, and uh, mm -hmm. one month after a, a new rector that had just joined us uh, that we'd helped transition in, uh, he, he started the parish in February, and then in March, uh, the pandemic hit. So there, the, that honeymoon period wasn't there. <laughs> but what we discovered, uh, really, uh, in, in terms of uh, helping each other through this, is, is, is first we realized that that ministry didn't end during the pandemic. This was something that uh, uh, that I have noticed among several of our of our clergy and even laity uh, who were who were leaders in, in the parish. They they worked uh, tirelessly during the pandemic uh, to provide uh, either newsletters or open houses or or. or just constant visitation, either by phone or, you know, when it allowed in-person visitation, just, just to remind us that the that parish ministry is more than just the building. It's more than just the, mm. uh, it's something where we gather. It, 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 there's a common idea of, of, that's given to Sunday school students. It said, what happens if our church isn't is burned down tomorrow? Is the church gone? No, the church is, is the people who make up the building. Uh, and I, as we discovered, uh, you know, even, even in State College, as as, I, as that as that, that pastor's first year, is that this was a this became uh, an opportunity post pandemic to to, to re envision ministry that for all of our churches, uh, whether uh, you, geographically where you may be, or whether you are experiencing an influx of people, or whether uh, people are returning slowly, is that all of our parishes right now are going through. Uh, a reboot, uh, a revitalization. It's uh, people are coming back to a, a different church as different people. 
Uh, and that's not something we should necessarily uh, be upset about or lament the loss of, but actually take an opportunity to uh, ex be excited and actually rethink things and to uh, to try new things and uh, and also be patient with one another, realizing that as we come back, there might be a different person running uh, an, a, a legacy ministry, or there might be f people who uh, were not are not present to uh, return to a ministry. But that that creates opportunities for us to to, to reimagine. And and one of the things that I wanted to do uh, in terms of uh, branching out and, and sort of becoming uh, essentially a missionary to some of the smaller communities within the diocese of, of Western Pennsylvania is is to help uh, help in this reboot process, but also uh, sort of get out of the way and allow uh, allow for this change to, to, to take place. Uh, I realized that be because I'd been there for so long, you know, the people were referring back, Let, let's let's just return to the, the the old normal. No, this is an opportunity to right. revisit. And, and and by stepping stepping out and by allowing uh, by by being a change agent herself, by saying, okay, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to step back and allow other people to uh, to come back and to uh, to share what they've learned during the pandemic, so that we can uh, go forward in ministry. So I, I would just to, to add what Joe said by just saying this is our the status of our churches are strong because we have gone back to the essentials. We have uh, realized that uh, that we are sacramental communities, and we we this is what we do. Uh, but it, but now it's an opportunity for us to reimagine, rethink ministry in, in light of. Of, of who is here with us now. This is our core, and we can go forward and, and, and certainly do great work for, uh, for the kingdom. Indeed. Um, I'm hearing a little bit of background noise or music or something from, from one of your mics, so I just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, you know, I, I, I want to follow up to this, and I, I, you know, in the opening, I talked a little bit about the idea of ministry itself. Um, you know, between the three of us, we're having this conversation, we're talking about ministry within the context of the Orthodox faith. And I dare say, uh, Joe, maybe you would be the best one to answer this because you have talked to literally hundreds of priests uh, in this area. Do you ever, uh, or, or people, do you ever encounter someone that says, well, you know, why are we talking about ministry? Um, that's, that's like, that's a Protestant thing. Or, um, well, yeah, we have a priest and he does ministry. Um, do you ever get this kind of push? Oh, absolutely. This? Yeah. Yeah. I think far less than maybe we would have uh, heard 10 years ago. Uh, I remember this, this sort of topic of ministry, uh, kind of crystallize in my head once as I did a workshop uh, at a parish in Cleveland. And uh, someone who I will say knew a good deal about the church, it wasn't the priest, uh, I used the term ministry. I asked them what the ministries were in the parish. And uh, this person raised his hand and said, well, what, what is that? Is that like a club? Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> Uh, right. <laughs> Sorry. But... I said, yeah, well, okay, yeah, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on who's allowed in and whatever. But uh, since then, it's been a kind of an interesting uh, study. And you, you raise a number of them. That's the priest's job. Uh, we're Orthodox here. We don't do that sort of thing. That's a, something that Protestants do. Uh, we're, I think we're getting vastly better. We're getting vastly better yes. at understanding that there are, what, two sides to our mission as a parish. One is to come together certainly to worship and to go upward to uh, ascend to God during worship. But then as, as we come back down and we go back into the world, we're called to... Uh, to do something about that, to make it real, to depart in peace and to bring that peace and that understanding to others as we go out and live live in the world. So I think I think right. we're getting a lot better at it. Um, but you know, ministry and well, I'll, I'll just say a, a more recent example yeah. though that that clicked relatively in connection to the 
the pandemic. I was speaking with a priest and and he, you know, he was saying it was this was only about six weeks ago that uh, his parish felt like a chapel. It felt like a place where things were happening, but there wasn't really an actual uh, set of efforts to move things forward, that they were sort of right. treading water. Now, he, I, I think probably in the last six weeks, that has changed somewhat for him. One of the things that we talked about is ministry. And he mentioned that uh, still a number of people in his parish, now it's a relatively, uh, it's a parish that's been in existence for, I'm not sure how long, 80, 90, 100 years, uh, that the whole question of what is ministry was still a fuzzy one for that for that parish. And quite frankly, right. you mentioned, Father, uh, at the beginning that we have this conference called the Parish Development Forum. The thing, that's one of the reasons we selected this uh, concept, this topic of ministry as this year's uh, focus for that, because we we came to realize that Number one, there's such a tremendous opportunity for us as we try not to go back to Egypt, but try to move forward as we come out of the pandemic. And there are so many things, good things that have, that have happened. If I can just you know, mention a couple of those that come to mind. You know, the, as, as awful as that was, uh, one of the things that I think Father Alexander sort of referred to it is it sort of caused us to break the bonds of always done it this way. We were forced to do things differently. Uh, we were forced to ask parish councils to get out of the bonds of being the place where they talk about bills, budgets, and buildings, and actually talk about how are we going to move forward to serve our members and serve others during this time. They took on new right. responsibilities. There were job changes, inevitable, right? So people are coming, sure. but they're going. And Father Alexander mentioned that, that as well. So that creates um, uh, a disruption in the parish. But in this, no, you know, we, none of us like disruption, really. But change, we know, is inevitable. And there is always the question of what are the sort of mechanisms that caused change to happen. And uh, uh, par excellence, so to speak, the pandemic was that in the life of parishes. And uh, I think one, one quick final point, I think the key thing that we learned, quite frankly, is talking to, talking to the rest of the world, using technology and streaming services. And I think we're learning that there are tremendous numbers of people that want to want to hear and right. see and taste the Orthodox faith, maybe before before they walk through the doors of your parish. For for sure, I mean, there there the the correlation between the explosion in the number of uh, inquirers and catechumens that we have, and the uh, introduction in so many places, including my own parish, of a. A video streaming ministry is is just too obvious, right? So people are able to peer in there, but frankly, in in my uh, in in my estimation, it's also kind of showing off. It's showing uh, maybe you know some of our weaknesses too, which is not a oh, bad sure. thing. So let's oh, remind sure. our listeners. Let's remind our listeners that you can give us a call at one eight five five AF Radio. Hey, tell us. What's going on in your parish now? How are you doing post-pandemic? How are you doing? Have you expanded your ministries? Did you just join the parish? Tell us what you're experiencing there. Maybe you want to start a ministry within the parish, but you're not sure how to do that. Give us a call or send us a text to 412-206-5012. So, Father Alexander, again, not to be sort of pedantic about this, but I do want to ask you just to kind of to get it for the record, if you will, define for us uh, maybe what a healthy parish looks like in your estimation. What is the center of the parish? But, you know, 
what's what's supposed to be going on in the parish and what are these ministries that we are referring to that uh you hope uh will expand in parishes give us a give us a, a verbal description of a healthy parish what's at the center of that parish and what are these ministries that you're referring to yeah, well, one beautiful thing about our, our faith and our theology and our ecclesiology is that we truly believe that on on the parish level we have the fullness of the church uh, we we don't look to a a large governing agency to 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 be the church i mean we we have everything it is to be church on that local level when when we have a blessing from our bishop uh, you know it often, in most cases it's a priest who has been assigned there to uh, to offer uh, intercessions on behalf of the people uh, and if everyone is there making the offering and doing so uh, to receive that offering back in the form of our Lord's body and blood. And that's something we all, we all participate in. And so our parish really I, it is, is a healthy parish is, is a community that uh, recognizes that, uh, that offering is commanded that we have to make an offering up to our Lord. And, and we also need to, to, as part of our offering, it's, it's not just the, the bread and wine that we bring every Sunday to offer up, but it's also the, the, the offerings of our time, our talent and treasure. And, and, and a healthy parish is, is one that, that is providing an, enough for, uh, for priests to live, uh, to, to do that ministry, to, uh, to meet with the inquirers, uh, to, to coordinate with the councils and to, and to begin to plan ahead. Oftentimes our, our parishes don't have an opportunity to think beyond six or nine months. If we're not doing that, we, we, we don't, know where we're going we don't have a vision to, to get there so it's important for us to, 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 to take a step back and and to make sure that if we're going to have a parish or we're going to have a parish council if we're going to to be entrusted uh, to, to make this offering is that we, we need first to, to to provide for uh for the priest and provide for the one who makes the, the intercessions on behalf of all people and, and to enable as, as you open the program okay. with father uh, is, is is to empower people to, to make that offering as a priesthood of, of all believers and we're all we're all called to make that offering and because we're unique we're every one of us is, is a different person created in god's image uh our, what we offer is different we, we we talk about preachers evangelists martyrs investors uh there's there's so many different roles within the church and and it all begins with with you know with the priest allowing and empowering people to 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 give the offering as that they're called to do and and for every parish that's different you know the the, uh, the ministry mix is, is going to be one that's going to evolve it's going to take on the unique characteristics of the people in in that community and uh, that's what makes you know all of our parishes unique and beautiful in their own in their in their own sense because they're, they're all they're, they're all the same but they're all all unique uh, and and that's what's really exciting about our, our our parish development forum coming up is because we are uh, a collection of people from a variety of, of sizes of parishes that are coming together with desire to learn more and to learn from each other. Uh, our sessions mm -hmm. are created to be one that isn't just a presentation, but it's an opportunity to, to listen to one another, to, to create uh, environments mm -hmm. where, where people can share their own experiences and to learn from one another because uh, oftentimes we, we try to recreate the wheel instead of coming in community and, and working out these solutions together. I see. Um, Joe, before we go to a break, can you just add a little bit to that in terms of, um, are there, min uh, uh, Father Alexander said this very well. He said that every parish is unique. And so the ministries that they may develop within a parish are uh, going to be unique to them. However, let, let me put it this way. Are there ministries both interior to the church and, and exterior, you know, outward looking ministries that really should be happening with most parishes, but, but in some there aren't? I would, I would agree with that, that there, there probably are. Um, I think when we start to learn and think about the term ministry, we we sort of 
once we get past is that a club we 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 sort of think in terms of the soup kitchen of the going out to, in charitable service to someone and i think that's good and i think that's proper and i think that so many more parishes do that today than 10 years ago so many more but i would i would suggest that some sort of external uh, i'll call it purely charitable uh something for the other so to speak is a is a fundamental i would say also and we're not as comfortable with this yet in figuring out how to do this i think there needs to be in parishes also looking outward some way some organized way in which they're communicating the orthodox faith the existing of existence of their parish their parish's identity mm -hmm. to the surrounding community in a sense of saying come taste and see evangelism spreading the gospel uh, that is not so much present. Now, we, 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 have, we have websites, we're streaming services, we're doing all many of the blocking and tackling aspects of those ministries, but <laughs> I would really like to see more parishes with an organized evangeliz evangelization is a word that will, will scare some people away in the parish. <laughs> But uh, that's really the word. That's really the well, word that, that probably let me, makes sense. Let me stop you there because I, right. I would like to talk a little bit about that on, on the other side of the break. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, I want to just unpack that a little bit because I think it's fascinating. Last week's episode was actually entitled The Evangelical Theology of the Orthodox Church. And we never really did get to talk about <laughs> what does that look like so i'm going to put you both on the spot uh -huh. i want you to dream a little bit and 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 go out on a limb and tell us because i think orthodox christians have a little bit of a difficult you know we don't want to be bible thumpers on the the corner you know are are you talking about passing out tracts what are you talking about uh when you say evangelization so we are going to go for a quick break. You are listening to Ancient Faith Today, and we will be right back. Father Tom will be back in a moment. In the meantime, the lines are open at 855-237-2346. Don't go away. Hi there. I'm Bobby Maddox, station manager of Ancient Faith Radio, and I would like to invite you to the 2022 Ancient Faith Content Creator Conference, which will be held at Antiochian Village from September 19th to the 22nd. The Ancient Faith Content Creator Conference is an outstanding professional development opportunity for creators of Orthodox Christian books and media. I am, of course, in charge of the radio and podcasting track, and I am pleased to announce that Ancient Faith Radio has four sessions devoted exclusively to the art and production of effective audio recordings, including one by Derek Cummins, an AFR producer, and another by Brian Jarbo, an engineer at National Public Radio. I myself will conduct introductions to the podcast process as well as to the genre of podcasting. Be prepared to learn a lot and leave the conference motivated and energized. Hope to see you there. Register at store.ancientfaith.com slash content dash creator dash conference dash 2022. That's store.ancientfaith.com slash content dash creator dash conference dash 2022. We're back with Ancient Faith Today and Father Tom Soroka. Give us a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Father Tom. Welcome back. We are talking with Joe Cormos and Father Alexander Cadman. We're talking about building up parish life and increasing ministry. And we got into a little discussion about evangelization. <laughs> Joe said he'd like to see uh, more evangelization in Orthodox parishes. Obviously, we have a lot to talk about tonight. But Joe, I'd like you to just go out on a limb here. 
uh, and and since you have this vision, what does that look like? Or let me put it this way, and Father Alexander, I'd love to get your uh, thoughts too on this. What have you seen that has been done that you feel is very effective and very orthodox and not just, you know, LARPing evangelical Protestants or something? <laughs> Yeah, I, in the in the break, I tried to find some uh, some information that I'd put together with a, on a webinar. Some I think it was almost ten years ago now. I I can't remember all the things with a Father Jonathan Ivanov, and he and I collaborated on a, a really fun series of webinars called the the Unchurched, and one of the segments in there was uh, talking about putting together a plan for the parish. Uh, as to have an outreach opportunity and activity. And of course, obviously this, uh, this will vary from parish to parish. One of the things, and this, uh, this probably will sound not as uh, visionary as, as you'd like, is simply for everyone to have their own personal narrative. Okay, <laughs> the answer to the question uh, many of you, uh, many listeners will know this as an elevator speech. Uh, why am I orthodox? Why am I a Christian? Why am I an orthodox Christian? Why do I go to this church? And right. simply putting that down as a goal. And I, <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I'm the guy without the collar here, so I, I get. Uh, no, painted in the that's... in the paint of uh, oh he's a secular thinker, but mm. uh, very often we don't have goals. We don't uh, the uh, the PN orthodoxy is for planning, as I've said many times. Uh, create a goal <laughs> that in which uh, everyone is encouraged to come together and create with some structure and some help their own personal narrative. And then uh, to find opportunities not to be overly aggressive, that because nobody wants that and it doesn't it doesn't work. Uh, to simply share that, and I'm you know I'm I'm terrible at this. <laughs> I'm talking. You're asking me to tell me a vision, but I don't do it as well as I should. And I have I have a kind of a built-in opportunity when I meet somebody on a bus and they say, "What do you do?" And I'm able to say, "Well, I I work." Uh, helping parishes become healthier. Well, what does that mean? Well, yeah. and I usually, you know, it's yeah. a tremendous opportunity. For the rest of us, well, it isn't say, always as easy. You, you know what they say, those who can't do, teach. So maybe that's, uh, <laughs> yes. that's why, you're, maybe. why you're teaching it. Maybe but, that's uh, why I'm here. Yes. <laughs> yes. Father, uh, Father Alexander, what do you think in terms of uh, uh, an evangelistic uh, orthodox uh, ministry, what, what what do you think that might look like? Uh, because Joe had talked about, by the way, and I just want to say, uh, this is exactly uh, what uh, Father John Parker says, the Dean of St. Econ Seminary. He says, everybody should be able to say what good God has done for them. I love that. Exactly. That, that kind yes. of, put, it's it's a very concise way of, of saying what, what Joe said, and that is, you know, think about your life. Think about what God means to you. Think about the good that God has done for you. And then just tell people that, right? But for some reason, we Orthodox are very uh, uh, scared to say that. So Father Alexander, t tell us what you think uh, that might look like. Yeah, in many ways, you know, I, I, I would say evangelism is actually easier done than said. And we, we tend to try to programize and, you know, and, you know, even the word evangelization sounds like, oh, they said there's a committee or there's someone else who's responsible for doing it. But it really comes from a misunderstanding about the divine liturgy itself. It, it doesn't end when, you know, with the with the, with the final blessing, you know, the, the, the benediction in the divine liturgy is, is for us to go out. We've been filled with joy. We've been, our mouths have been filled with thy praise. And we're not to be like sponges that, that take up all the water and, and just hold it into ourselves. Uh, we really are to go out mm -hmm. and the, to be wrong for, for God to, to really squeeze uh, that, that what mm -hmm. we've been filled up with out on those who we've come into contact with. So we really must have to be ready to, to truly 
uh, be able to share the good news that we've received in our churches with those we come in contact with. There's everybody has someone they come in contact with uh, uh, during the week, and and certainly be be ready uh, to, to to share that good news uh, to to um, to have a defense for. Uh, the, the faith that we we have received at the Divine Liturgy. Indeed. And the best way, the easiest way to do that really is if you want somebody to, to ask you about the joy you have or the wonderful experiencing experiences that you have at the Divine Liturgy, uh, is, is to ask them, as, what, what do you do on a Sunday? What, uh, what, uh, what, what are some things that you do to find meaning in your life? And if right. you're sincerely interested in, in, in wanting to find the answer the people that you you come into contact with, and you really care about them in a way that 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 is that that transcends uh, all the, all of the visions and that, that we experience in, in the world today. They'll they'll recognize that love in you, and and they'll if if you ask them sincerely, they'll ask you back. Say, well, what about you? What 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 gives you hope? What gives you uh, the courage to continue on? And you can tell them about. Uh, about what, what you've experienced in the divine liturgy, and better yet, bring them. You know, we, there's a, the statistic right. is you know maybe uh, the four percent of people respond to an advertisement on Facebook to come, or or, or even less. But a hundred percent of the people you bring to church come, uh, and it takes it takes a, a, it it takes some boldness. But it but if you if you do it, it says come come with me. I'd love to pick you up and, and bring you to church and uh, and and let let the let the services itself let 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 God be the one to to truly work in the hearts. You know, it's not our responsibility. Really, it's really up to God to to to, to open up people's eyes and to open up their hearts. And we just have to be present and be ready to to, to to be there and um and to and to as 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 our Lord uh, reaps the harvest for sure. Good. Excellent. Yeah, Thank couple, you. Sure, Joe. Go I, ahead. I, I was going to add something, and I know we we probably need to get back to the general topic of ministry, but, you know, it's interesting balancing the question of programmatic and goal-oriented and structure that Father Alexander sort of eschewed there. I completely agree that it, it, it has to be done one person at a time, one person at a time. But... Uh, I think parishes can put together some structure if it's if it's mm -hmm. uh, tracking the number of new faces, uh, how many come back, right. what reasons right. they they gave for not coming back, what I, identifying a set of steps that new people move along in terms of becoming not only uh, coming back, but becoming catechumens or formal inquirers, catechumens, and then orthodox, and then to build them on a path to being good ministers within the parish. So I think, yeah, we can go on and on about this uh, interesting thing. And uh, one final, you know, thought, of course, is that just as not everyone is a wonderful singer, not everyone <laughs> is cut out exactly to be uh, you know, a sharer of his or her faith a in a, a totally active way, you know, so mm -hmm. we don't want to create programs that make people feel bad or then cause right. them to criticize them as, oh, now we've got this slick marketing thing going on. <laughs> no, that's not in any way what I'm saying. And I, I you know, sometimes I hear that no, that's, from people. No, it's, it's a very, very good point. We, we, um, we want, I, I think that's the whole point about ministry, right? And that leads us to the next question. Um, and we want to remind our listeners, there's still a few minutes left. If you would like to call 1-855-AF-RADIO, we'd love to hear from you. Maybe you have some have some ideas about how you are doing things differently in your parish. Brag about your parish. Tell us what good things yes. are happening in your parish. We would love to hear that also. I'm I'm a great fan of ripping other parishes off in terms of all the good things that they do. And I say, oh, I want to do that, too. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. This is this is a true story. Um, I, what during the pandemic, when uh, we were having at one point, I was having four liturgies a week and it was really wearing me out. It was uh -huh. it was very difficult. And then eventually we kind of settled into the two liturgy, liturgies a week, right? Because we wanted to give people enough space and so forth. <clears throat> and I saw that one parish, and I'm not going to say who, what parish it was, 
they did a because uh, I was trying to balance like there's some people that really don't want to wear masks. And there's some people that really do want to wear masks. So that's what I did. I said, you know, this liturgy and it ended up being the Saturday liturgy is for all the people that really like you. You got to have lots of social distancing. You have to feel really safe. We're going to keep the numbers down. And, and you've got to wear a mask, and that's going to be the Saturday liturgy. Sunday liturgy is going to be like more laissez-faire, and maybe you don't want to wear it, and you know, you're going to have more people. And we said that our limit on that liturgy was going to be 75. Well, I actually got that, that idea from another church, and everybody was like, how did you come up with that idea? And I said, oh, I said, it just <laughs> occurred to me. But the reality was I got it from another church and it, it worked brilliantly. It was just really ch terrific. All right. So uh, anyway, <laughs> let's, uh, I, I want to talk about this. This is like a problem. This is a problem that every parish has, virtually every mm -hmm. parish. And that is this 80-20 rule, right? The 80-20 rule simply says that 20% of the people generally do 80% of the work. Um, they are the eight, the 20% that are really involved, right? And it's not that every, you know, everybody doesn't do anything. It's a matter of the this core is really involved. So my question is, how do we sort of engage people that that other 80 percent to get them more involved in the ministries of the church let's assume at this point that you know there are vibrant ministries in a parish but not everyone is taking advantage of getting involved in a ministry how do you go about that uh who would like to take a crack at that one first well i've, I've got some some thoughts i i don't know that in okay. the next five minutes we'll solve that problem which has been a, well that's all in existence <laughs> forever of course of course so uh if sure, anyone's right. listening we'll, we'll make sure they don't be disappointed i you know i thought a little bit about that ahead of time i think you know one of the one of the things that i don't think we do a very good job of is the idea of giftedness and understanding giftedness and understanding that, you know, I think, what is it, Corinthians 12, uh, you know, there, there are different members of the body, different functions. We all bring something different to the, uh, to the parish. But working, simply talking about that, talking about those charisms that we receive, and attempting to understand those uh, on the part of at least many more people in the parish, if not everyone, that you're not going to get everyone to do everything, but to simply work through, perhaps using some sort of ministry coordinator, because this would be a fair amount of work. You know, and priests have a lot to do. And uh, uh, as was pointed out, sometimes they they have to have second jobs whatever um so learning to you uh, use giftedness use various evaluations for giftedness through a ministry coordinator perhaps that can then lead to a sort of a pathway to discipleship for individual persons each person yeah, has I, their own unique pathway, and right. that can be defined. The priest, of course, would be involved with the ministry coordinator. Now, you, of course, have to be lucky enough to be have someone gifted enough to do that very uh, empathetic job. Uh, other thoughts, I mean, talking to a priest today about the concept of gatekeepers that we all <laughs> No, and probably I, I probably serve as one on occasion, uh, but busting down those those gates. Uh, he talked about something he should have done with the head of one of the ministries in his parish, and the 
the the good thing of the pandemic is that this this gentleman had to move away to take care of his mother. And, so you're, uh, that you're left saying a, that this is somebody that kind of hogged and 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 kept it to themselves or kept new people. Well, out. Uh, we're going to do it my way, right? We're going to do this thing, whatever the ministry is, my way. That that to me is a gatekeeper. I and got it. Uh, yeah. and and uh, in order for that person, for someone to get into this ministry, so to speak, you know, they have to pass muster with me, whatever that might be. Uh, now, there are some reasons to have inquires people that can sing, but beyond that, um, there, there, it's a kind of a social construct that people become owners of things and they become sort of unwilling to hear new ideas from others. So I, I'm going on here, Father Alexander. Okay. You probably yeah. have some yeah, ideas just, as oh, well. Just, yeah. Now, just, how can just, you uh, get to, people to, involved there? Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, I mean, real quickly, because I. Uh, but first of all, is it's definitely like, for example, I'm the acting rector of St. Mary and Michael Orthodox Parish. Uh, so it, it is we can do the same thing with our with our ministries. So, so for just trying to get people involved, say this is just a trial period. We're going to try this for three uh, or, or six six months, and if it's not for you, then you you can step out graciously. Yeah. So it does allow for some people to not feel like they have to uh, to, to be in it forever. Uh, and it's a great time to do this as we get close to Pentecost, is to approach your ministry leaders and say, you know, would you like to re-up uh, your, your your service to the church or would you like to uh, take a sabbatical and and, and invite and help the, the parish priest with the ministry mm. where you bring new people in life to the church. And also there's, you know, there's another idea you can do for your parish as well is that some, oftentimes some people will step back because they don't feel like they have a voice or they don't feel like a, uh, that they have a complete buy-in, but uh, occasionally, and there should be a strategic time. There should be a time of visioning where where everyone comes together and has an opportunity to just uh, to brainstorm and to have their voice heard. And a great question to ask is, if God had His way with your parish, what would it look like in five years? And oh, and uh, and to put that question out for the people and and to put it on the whiteboard and have everyone. Uh, yeah. uh, put on stickies and and just uh, create environments where people can can have their opinions shared and and uh, and when they feel like they 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 truly have a stake then then yes involvement does increase interesting yeah interesting you know so to jump in people there have i to think feel like I think they have a stake a... in it <laughs> yes yeah. yes and uh dialogue uh, to go back to the concept of what is a healthy parish uh, we could go on and on about that i've i've got a number of uh, of thoughts, but I think I think a healthy parish is one in which they're trying to get better, and they're capable of dialoguing about new things and going in different directions. And you know, a lot of times laypersons, a lot of times clergy are afraid of open-ended conversation because we don't know exactly where it's going to go. Sure. And but right. I think you can then find out the types of situations and types of ministries that might have appeal to some of those folks on the fringe or in the margins right. and uh, you know in the 80 versus the the 20 um okay. probably probably other thoughts but uh we'll let you i don't know how far uh, yeah we, well we we are actually we're approaching the top, at the top of the of hour, the hour. Yeah, we only have about five minutes left. So I want to ask you one more question regarding ministry, and then uh, I'd like you to tell us about the conference and how people can uh, sign up. So, sure, sure. That we have all of these, it seems to me, right? No matter where a church is, there are ministry opportunities outside of the, the parish community. So I'm not speaking about teaching a Bible study or teaching church school or, you know, yes, yes. doing the youth group or whatever. I'm talking about somehow ministering. The standard to, decades old ministry. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. To, to, to people outside <clears throat> of the Orthodox Church, outside the walls of the church that may have uh, great needs or whatever. This is by far has been now uh, things have changed tremendously in the last 30 years 
However, there are still many, many, many parishes that are extremely insular and do not yes. have any kind of outreach outside of their own needs. So here's the question. Um, how can we convince Orthodox Christians that this is important? You know, how do we get Orthodox Christians to engage in the community outside the parish walls? How do we do that? Joe, we'll start with you and then let's go to Father okay. Alexander. Well, I the 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 one tactic that I have used with some success, now it's not a it's not a broad kind of thing, is simply what in business we would call benchmarking, visiting another in business company that is doing something well to learn from them. And I've taken groups of, of parishioners from parishes somewhat like what you said, that, that there is a sort of insularity. And there was a, a small group of people who were thirsting to break through that insularity. I've taken them to parishes like St. Gregory of Nyssa in Columbus, Ohio, that has, you know, been really kind of on the forefront of, of outreach kinds of things with a Saturday lunch program. I'm not sure if they're exactly if they still do that or what the story is there, but having people go there to see on a Saturday or some other situation, see Orthodox parishes where this had become the fabric was incredibly powerful. I can name two or three parishes who now have a much stronger kind of out, uh, charitable outreach simply as a result of having seen that. Now, obviously, so maybe there's some, some good ways to take a, create videos to share what is going on in parishes. Um, so those are some thoughts. Father yeah, Alexander. I like that. Uh, Father Alexander? Yeah, just real quickly, I would remember uh, that we, we start Lent with uh, the reading of Matthew 25. It's important that we remember that uh, that we are we the church and we exist for those people who are not yet members of our community. Uh, and remember the, the what what Matthew 25 tells us, that uh, who, who Christ truly is. It's the least of these, uh, the brethren. And to, to, to make sure to have intentional outreach and, and that uh, have a vision for outreach uh, that deals with the, the sick, uh, the, the hungry, the homeless. Uh, but, but remember, that this is not just a place where we, we come to, to get filled up ourselves, but, but we truly need to, uh, uh, to, to realize that we do exist uh, for, the, for those yet who are not yet members. And, and, uh, and that, that, that takes time to, to build that, uh, that culture. Uh, but stick with it, uh, it, that God is working in us. And if we allow uh, uh, that change to take place in us, we can be a change for others as well. Indeed, indeed. So uh, tell us about the conference that's coming up and uh, how people can sign up. Joe? Great. Uh, June 17th will be the ninth year in which we're offering the Parish Development Forum. We're hoping to get back to an in, in-person uh, version of this soon because it's much more fulfilling. But uh, as a one-day online conference, uh, it, it really has worked out quite well, and this will be our third year doing it online. The theme, again, June 17th, the theme for this year is Parishes as Vessels of Ministry with a sub-theme sub of increasing your parishes capacity for ministry. And there'll be three tracks, three parallel tracks throughout the day. One uh, designed and will be led by Father Alexander uh, for those people who are really thirsty and interested in uh, living active ministry. And that's the name of the track. Uh, there'll be three segments offered about internal sorts of ministries, looking at ministry in different way. And to the, the, the previous question, one, one session exactly on topic of how you can learn your local needs, even if you're in the most beautiful suburb in the world and you're not in an urban parish, 
because everyone mm-hmm. uses that, not everyone, often you hear that, that uh, um, excuse, so to speak. Well, we're in a very nice neighborhood. There's nothing to do here. Uh, so that's one. Mm. A, a second track is reinventing education. Education is fundamental, we think, to ministry, uh, helping all of us to understand the what, why, and how of ministry, but also just the ministry of learning our faith and learning to grow in our faith and to do that in a uh, shall I, can, can I use the word modern <laughs> in a less ancient way? Sure. Uh, uh, and, and so we'll be talking a number of segments on how to reinvent that. What are the needs of youth? Uh, interesting study that's been done. And then finally, I'll be leading a, 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 a track called uh, Leading and Coordinating Ministry. So that would be primarily for ministry coordinators, people who are in parish councils, who are looking to overhaul the ministry mix in their parish. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, delegating, leading, staffing, finding new ministries, brainstorming some ministries for your parish. And uh, we'll, we'll close the day with a, uh, with a panel uh, within that context. And then, then the end of the day will be uh, well, we have a case study that we'll all sort of deal with in our separate separate tracks and uh, try to uh, apply the things we've learned. So to register, uh, if you go to OCA.org, uh, in, the, in a recent, there's been a recent uh, um, news item that if you search down one or two there, that's probably the easiest way to verbally mm-hmm. tell you how to re- register. Uh, someone could send an email to me, J-O-E-K-O-R-M-O-S-1 at gmail.com, and I'm happy to send you the link. You do have to register in order to get the links to get into the conference. Uh, the fee is uh, up to you. You can give us a lot of money. You can, if it's, if it's easier and better to attend, Without a without a fee, that's fine as well. We we just want you there because we're so excited about this opportunity, this post COVID opportunity to bring people back to ministry. Indeed, um, I placed the link, Joe, in oh, our great, Facebook great. Uh, oh, uh, stream that's happening right now, so everybody can go there and get that. Uh, and we'll also have that on the Ancient Faith Today live. Uh, Facebook page also. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Father Alexander Cadman and Joe Thank Cormos, you. thanks for all your work. Uh, best wishes with the success of your uh, program as it continues and flourishes and helps people uh, make their parishes a better place. I think this is a really important um, a really important topic, and I think a lot of people ignore it to the peril of their parishes. Uh, Parishes don't build themselves. Uh, It takes sort of organization. It takes intentionality. And of course, then God will bless it. All right, Joe, uh, Father Alexander, thank you very much. Thank you, Father, for having us. Before I share a few final thoughts, again, I want to offer my sincere thank you to Joe Cormos and Father Alexander Cadman for joining us tonight. Thanks to John Maddox for engineering the program, to our show production assistant, Melissa, for her work behind the scenes, for everybody that's listening in, and to those who uh, will listen in. I wanted to share with you a uh, Bible uh, uh, passage that really... I think, gets to the essence of what we're talking about when we talk about a healthy parish with healthy ministries. This goes all the way back to the scriptures, uh, and it is very, very clear. It says, this is from Acts chapter 2, Then they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of the bread and in the prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, 
as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And that's our show for tonight. Remember to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ancientfaithtoday. Share out our program after that's posted. Give us your feedback and contact us with any ideas or topics that you might want to hear about. Join us next Tuesday evening for another edition of Ancient Faith Today. Good night, everybody. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. You're listening to AncientFaithRadio.com. New from Ancient Faith Publishing. Secret Turning, a collection of short stories by Stephen Signori. So, I'm out in the lot of Odo Heaven, and up comes Father Naum from behind, grabs me, gives me a kiss, and tells me he's happy to see me wearing his worn-out dungaree bib overalls with the beat-up straw Stetson, pulling his wire basket, going shopping on the avenue. How old is Naum, anyway? Sharky asked. Older than he acts, Lefty said. Two beer ready, said, yeah, and younger than he seems. So he says to me, Theodri, the church is much better when you're there. It's not the whole family when we don't see you. You know, God misses his children, and Nana Olga misses her son. Now available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook at store.ancientfaith.com. Welcome to Ancient Faith Presents. I'm Bobby Maddox, station manager of Ancient Faith Radio. And today I will be speaking with Benedict Sheehan and Lydia Given. Benedict is the composer and director of a new recording by the St. Tikon Choir, simply titled Vespers. And Lydia Given is the general manager of the St. Tikon Choir and media coordinator for Capella Records. Welcome to the program, you two. It's great to be here. Great to speak with you. Really excited to be here today. All right, so Benedict, you and the St. Tikon Choir have already released one album with Capella Records uh, that featured the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom and which debuted at number two on Billboard and number one on Amazon. What made you want to take on the Vesper service as well? Uh, well, this, the, uh, the uh, story of this recording is that it actually predates the liturgy, so it, it had to be done at some point. And it's something that's been on my mind to do for a while to compose this as a follow-up to the liturgy. Uh, but I think it was even like six years ago, Father Sergius, the abbot of St. Pecan's Monastery, had come to me and said, I would want you to compose Vespers. And in fact, at the time, he said a whole vigil. And then later on, it became evident that this would be better as a project that just primarily focused on Vespers. Um, so he brought this up with me probably five or six years ago, and then some other things got in the way, and other pro projects came to the fore. And I wrote the liturgy and recorded it. But then uh, over the course of the pandemic, um, I had a lot of time to compose. And it seemed like it was the right time now to, to bring my focus back to this music and to setting the Vespers. So among the other, among the several projects that I worked on over the course of the, I don't know, the first nine months or so of the pandemic was composing this piece. It wasn't clear quite yet when we were going to be able to record it, but then um, as things started to open up again and the pandemic seemed to be in the rear view, we, we were able to put a group together and plan a project. And so we recorded it last July. Then, as we all are aware, things didn't look so great. <laughs> Can and uh, so it seems like we actually kind of managed to sneak it in 
in between the two kind of difficult per periods of, of the pandemic. Now, thank God, things seem, seem to be opening up once again and we're, we're able to plan projects. But it was a thing that had to be done and, and to have a Vespers following up with the liturgy um, it felt like a n natural thing to do and it's a good release for a year after. Lydia, how does this collaboration between Benedict and the St. Tikon Choir work? Does Benedict approach you with an idea? Do you approach him? What is that process like?